Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Riot's Lunch and Learn series. Oh, we'll just need you to hit. Got it. Okay. We're doing a hybrid session today. So this is going to be awesome, everyone. Um, sorry, just a hit and got it. I don't know how to hit got it. <laughs> but welcome. Uh, we have some in-person participants and some virtual participants. So if you're joining us virtually, thank you so much. Just a couple of quick reminders before I hand it over to a partner with Aurora Group, who will then introduce Corey Stone, who is our speaker for the day. This session is being recorded. It will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and then shared out via the meetup group where you registered. And then everyone here will be able to view it later as well. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please do put those in the chat box. We'll be monitoring both in-person questions and virtual questions. Um, and the best way to view this presentation is in speaker view. That'll give you a nice big view of the presentation and then our speaker, Corey Stone. But without further ado, Thank you for being with us today. I'll hand it over to Aparna. Thank you, Caroline, for that kind introduction. As she mentioned, I'm with the Aurora Group and represent support a variety of electromechanical components for manufacturers. Today, we are bringing you a lunch and learn session in person and virtually, we're gonna try this, with Tai Chen on the topic of jitter and performance in oscillators. Just a few words about the Aurora Group. We are a uh, premier manufacturer's representative firm for over 30 years with all kinds of electromechanical component experience. Basically, we advise on electronic and mechanical components from quality manufacturers, guide through technical challenges, and hopefully help in the supply liaison, quotes, order sampling, and expediting. There's some trouble in the world right now, so hopefully we can still help through that. Uh, we cover in the what's formally called the Dixie States, which is uh, Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and sometimes Florida. We're headquartered in Raleigh. Some of these folks you might know. So uh, Bob covers South Carolina, Karen's covering Georgia, Bruce covers Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Ken and I both split North Carolina. Whenever you need to reach out to us, one of the best people to get a hold to get a hold of us is Kathy Hill, who's our expert sales manager, and you probably recognize her name as well. We cover all kinds of markets and all kinds of solutions. Uh, even if we don't have it, we can certainly guide you in the right way. Here's a quick look at all of our lines so far, and there's always more coming and changing, so feel free to reach out to us anytime. Uh, you can see highlighted in the middle is Platronics and Tai Chen because that is the highlight for today. We're also associated with many organizations, including the Riot, who we love and appreciate. And of course, we work with all the distribution partners. And here today, I'm going to introduce uh, Corey Stone. He's one of the directors over at Tai Chen. Uh, he's been working in the crystal oscillator industry for over 25 years. He is a true expert. And not only that, he presents really well and clearly so that anybody can understand frequency control devices, crystals, oscillators, VCXO, TCXOs, and more. I'm now going to welcome Corby. Now the applause light flashes. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so uh, how am I doing, Caroline? Am I in the in screen? Okay, perfect. So, uh, you know, I do appreciate uh, Riot uh, being able to uh, facilitate this event, and I appreciate you guys making the effort to come down virtually. I drove here to or come down in person because I drove here too, and it was a difficult ride uh, with all the rain. And I appreciate everybody that's attending virtually. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to provide some information for you on crystals and oscillators, jitter and, and uh, performance in oscillators. So, you know, we'll do a quick Tai Chi overview just so you know who we are. We'll do a quick introduction on jitter. Um, we'll talk about how we measure jitter and the different types of jitter. We'll talk about jitter versus phase noise. Uh, and then we'll look at some examples of jitter in, in jitter performance in our oscillators. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with tips for improving jitter performance in your designs. 
So Tai Chien has been around since 1976. We are a Taiwanese-based manufacturer. Um, we are listed on the Taiwan Stock Exchange, so you can go out and find us there. And I think the reason why we've been around so long is because of the quality that we our products provide. Um, all our facilities are ISO certified or uh, automotive certified to the TS16949 specification, and and I think that's important. Uh, you know, to you know because. People really do want to use our parts and your parts for a long period of time. Our product offerings uh, uh, stretch from crystals all the way through timing modules and really everything in between. And one of the things that makes Tai Chi a little bit different is the fact that we all, oops, what happened there? Is that we also uh, grow our own quartz. And, you know, that's really an area that we've been investing a lot of research and development into because to make small, you know, smaller size parts, we use more chemical milling processes and, and the ability to fabricate those small quartz crystals uh, um, as, you know, really starts with the bar quartz. And so I think that's one of the differentiators for, for Tai Chan as a manufacturer. So we'll start out with the most basic of our products, our crystal products. Um, the crystals, uh, uh, the only thing you can really do with a crystal is make an oscillator. And so, you know, we have a full line of crystals uh, ranging from the larger five by 3.2 or seven by five types all the way down to the smaller sizes. And we're actually going to be, we have our 1.6 by 1.2 millimeter uh, package up here on the screen, but later on this year, we'll be introducing a 1.2 by 1.0 millimeter size crystal. And so the size goes down. You know, um, the industry trend is to go towards smaller packages. The predominant package right now, and really the package you should be looking at for new designs is 3.2 by 2.5 millimeter or smaller. 3.2 by 2.5 is the most cost effective package in the marketplace. And, you know, uh, the, you know, the larger packages like seven by five or five by 3.2 are getting more difficult to get and going up in price. And so, you know, that's going to impact your designs and the longevity of your designs. Clock oscillators, like I said, are really the next step up from crystals. You know, you take the crystal and you connect it to your X1, X2 input of your microprocessor, and that has an oscillator circuit. The difference is we pull that oscillator circuit out and we stick it inside our package. Similar to crystals, these come in seven by five or five by 3.2 or smaller packages. And again, we encourage you to start looking at 3.2 or 2.5 uh, by 2.0 or even smaller 2.0 by 1.6 in terms of, of package size. The, um, the, like I said, the larger packages are just getting more difficult to get and more expensive. And so, you know, go down in size. We have all the logic types available. We have CMOS, we have LV PECL, um, LVDS and HCML. So in that regard, we've got a, a wide variety of oscillators and, you know, really the jitter performance isn't of, of an oscillator isn't necessarily dictated by the size. It's really dictated by the semiconductor that we put inside it. So size is not really, does not really drive your performance and, and shouldn't really um, make that big of a difference to, to use the smaller packages. The next step up would be TCXOs, and and uh, generally we're you know in in frequency control we're trying to keep things as stable as possible, and unfortunately temperature stability or the temperature is the one of the largest sources of error in crystal oscillators, and so what we do is we have the TCXO or temperature compensated crystal oscillators where we put a temperature sensitive circuit inside with the oscillator and that helps drive or change the frequency of the crystal as it changes over temperature. Here size does matter to some degree from the standpoint that you know the higher frequencies tend to be in the larger packages and then um, the smaller the smaller parts tend to have a little bit less temperature control capability. So for highly accurate devices you might be looking at a seven by five or a five by 3.2. For, you know, I'll say the typical TCXO, the package of choice is probably 2.0 by 1.6 millimeters. And that's your most cost effective package in terms of, of really uh, uh, size and performance. Good TCXOs can achieve uh, 0.1 part per million. Um, that's 100 part per billion. 
but we actually have products that can achieve slightly better than that. And so for like a test and measurement application or a microwave transmitter application, you might need a more accurate time source than what can be provided by a TCXO or a clock oscillator, and that would be an OCXO. OCXO stands for oven controlled crystal oscillator. So different than the TCXO where we're compensating the crystal for its change in frequency as a function of temperature. And OCXO actually controls the temperature of the crystal. So it doesn't see any temperature change at all. We heat the crystal up to a temperature that's higher than the highest outside ambient we expect. And we control that temperature of the crystal to milladegrees. And it's that temperature control that gives us a very good temperature stability or a very good performance. Like I said, one part per billion is a typical stability or 10 part per billion might be a typical stability for an OCXO. Typical, like I said, for what you'd need for a transceiver or a, a network switch or a piece of test and measurement gear. The OCXOs tend to be a little bit larger. Nine by seven millimeters is our smaller one. But here, you know, contrary to what I was saying earlier with the other products where I was recommending you go down in size here, you know, size actually aids performance. So I encourage you to use it as big as possible. The bigger it is, the more insulation we can get around the oven and then the better temperature control we're able to maintain on that oven. And so it helps your cost, improves your performance. And so, you know, with OCXOs, generally bigger is, is better. The next thing, if we need something better than an OCXO would be a timing module. A timing module, actually time is, is the second largest source of error in, a, in an oscillator. Um, the aging or the frequency drift with respect to time. And, and so what we do with the timing module, we take an OCXO or a TCXO and we lock it to a high precision timing signal like GPS or the one PPS that comes out of a GPS signal. And then we compare our OCXO to that timing signal and we actually compensate our oscillator's timing um, you know, relative to that timing signal. The neat thing is, if that timing signal goes away, then we've got memory inside the timing module that can continue to compensate the OCXO's performance for a longer period of time. And so we can achieve phase accuracies of one and a half milliseconds from anywhere from a few hours to a few days. And we actually have introduced a chip scale atomic clock this year that can hold, hold that one and a half microseconds for probably a few months. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's just a different technology, but, you know, so we've really covered the gamut, but the one thing that all these oscillators have in common is that they all produce noise or they all produce, they all have jitter. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today was the jitter performance of our, of our oscillators. And, and, you know, just by way of introduction, you know, um, high data rate applications are growing. We're streaming this live, uh, you know, over the internet. Um, we all are working from home and connected to the cloud in some way. We all have an Alexa with, you know, the lights and things that we turn on and off. And those IoT devices, that internet connectivity is, you know, what's driving our need for higher speeds and higher bandwidths. I heard someone say the other day that a person's character can be measured by the a slow internet speed. Um, and if you've ever been sitting there streaming a movie and had the hourglass come up waiting to get it, you know, you can kind of understand that. But the result is just an increased need for data rates and speeds and wider bandwidths. And this creates the need for improved performance from our clock standpoint um, and, you know, improved performance with different form factors so we can support all the different requirements. And jitter is one of the key measures of clock performance affecting these high speed applications. So, you know, what is jitter? Um, it's not drinking too much coffee, um, but it is, uh, if we look at our oscillators, our oscillators frequency um, is, is driven by clock pulses. Um, the number of clock pulses it produces every second um, is the frequency and the inverse of frequency is time. And uh, over time, uh, in an ideal world, every clock pulse would have the same length of time and would occur with the same period. Um, but unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. Our clock pulses are not always the same and there is some variation. And in that regard, that variation is jitter. 
The ITU definition of jitter is short-term variations of the significant instance of a digital signal from their ideal positions in time. It's a lot to take in, but you know, basically it's the difference between where an edge is and where it should be. And here we have an example or a drawing down below. You know, we show the ideal clock period in the black line. That would be one unit interval or one period. And occasionally we see it might be a little bit shorter in terms of time. It might be a little bit longer in terms of time, but there is variation in that time. And that's the amount of that variation. That's the jitter that we're talking about. So now we can look at the different types of jitter because depending on what causes it, we might get a different response or see a different performance. And the two basic types of jitter are random jitter and deterministic jitter. Both of these have pretty much a, a normal distribution. Random, distribu random jitter has the typical Gaussian type of distribution. It's ubiquitous, it's system noise, it's really everywhere. It's the noise that's present in our environment. It's the noise that we create. It's, you know, it's difficult for us to control, if not impossible for us to control. It's really something that we have to live with. Deterministic jitter is, is, is bounded. Um, it's determined, the min and max values are really determined by the source of the jitter and that source is generally contained in your system. Things deterministic jitter comes in two primary types, data dependent and periodic jitter. Data dependent is really driven by your um, your processing. It's the um, it's the, the noise that's created from the data pattern and the signals that you're sending across the board. And so these would you know, or the transmission losses that are on your board or the reflections that are on your board or the bandwidth that your circuit is able to take, you know, that determines your, your, your data dependent jitter. The jitter that we'll spend most of the time on today is the periodic jitter, um, which is really kind of everything else. It's the, the noise that comes from the AC signal that you feed into it, the power supply switching speed that you have, and also the oscillators that you use. Again, it has an upper, a min and a max value. And so we can look at it that way. It will have harmonic content depending on the type of oscillator you use or the power supply you use. But like I said, oscillators is probably one of the largest contributors of noise to that. So if you've got a noise problem, one of the first things you wanna look at probably would be your clock and, and what type of clock you're using. So whenever we look at the periodic jitter, there's several types of that. And, you know, generally it comes down to whether we look at it in terms of the frequency domain or the time domain. Um, the time domain jitter is about the accuracy of the clock period itself. Uh, we'll talk about cycle to cycle jitter or period jitter or time interval error jitter. Um, frequency domain jitter is predominantly about the, uh, um, the, the, it's sometimes referred to as the phase jitter or the phase noise. It's the noise that occurs against a particular frequency. Um, your, again, the switching speed of your power supply or the clock speed of your, uh, of your, of your oscillator. The difference is in between time domain and frequency domain is what they measure and how they give us the ability to see the different types of jitter that we were talking about there. So, you know, the first type of jitter that we'll talk about is cycle to cycle jitter. This is important in computing applications. It's the difference in one time period or one pulse versus the next adjacent pulse. And that's one of the keys. You know, you compare the first clock pulse one and you compare it to the second clock pulse two and then you compare clock pulse two to clock pulse three. And it's that variation in time that we're talking about in terms of that cycle to cycle jitter. Um, it, you know, they can be cycle to cycle. Um, it can be, uh, oops, I'm on the wrong slide, sorry. So um, basically it can be measured in an RMS value. Um, it can be done in a peak to peak value, um, which compares the shortest clock pulse difference to the longest clock pulse difference. Um, but uh, um, in that regard, it's really measuring the maximum distance difference between one clock pulse to the next clock pulse. And that's key in terms of making sure it's an adjacent cycle period because period jitter is really where we compare the pulse width of one cycle to any other cycle within a given sample. 
the period of each cycle is measured across a large number of samples. And then we can get the statistical variation of the timing um, you know, from that. Um, it's either RMS period jitter, which is the standard deviation of the, the longest clock pulse to the uh, um, shortest clock pulse or peak to peak period jitter, which is the difference between the longest clock period and the shortest clock period. So, you know, the reason why I bring that up is, is because, you know, a lot of times it's kind of like, you know, speed, you, you have, if I told you I was doing 120, you'd say, wow, that's a, that's a lot, but I'd say oh, I was in Canada and that's kilometers per hour. So we really have to understand the units that kind of follow that, whether it's RMS, whether it's peak or peak to peak you know, type of thing. But the key difference here is that it's measured across a number of cycles where we would compare the period of clock pulse one to perhaps the period of clock pulse three or the period of clock pulse two to the period of clock pulse 1000. You know, these also look at low frequency jitter because we're taking measurements, you know, over a thousand cycles or over 10,000 cycles. And that would determine the, you know, the type of jitter or the range of jitter that we actually see. Period jitter is generally what we use to measure system time and margin, um, you know, so we can tell whether or not our, our system is able to, to take the amount of variation that we see, um, you know, from the jitter in the clock. The next one would be time interval error jitter. And this is generally what we use in communications applications and is generally the primary measure of jitter that we see in data sheets or that we talk about whenever we talk about jitter since communications is probably, probably the, the uh, jitter is one of the more important parameters there. It's com instead of comparing it to the next clock cycle or the adjacent clock cycle or another clock cycle down the line, we're comparing the period of a clock cycle to the ideal period. Um, and so this gives us a, 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 the actual time error of the clock pulse and we can actually accumulate that or we can look at it individually, you know, in terms of a single pulse, but, you know, the time interval error here would be clock pulse one and here was where it should really be. And, and we can see, or the dotted line is where it should actually be. And here's where it actually ends. And that's a time error. And we need to understand that amount of time error. And, and the second clock pulse may be slightly different. Um, and so we need to look at the, whenever we look at that, we talk about the RMS value of that time error. We talk about the peak to peak value of that time error, but either way, um, generally we talk about it over a particular bandwidth and that bandwidth is generally determined by your communications protocol. Sonnet has a bandwidth of 12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. And so we would generally look at the, the time error over that particular modulation range of, of frequencies. And so typically we hear one picosecond RMS over 12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. Well, you know, that's because of the bandwidth of the protocol. And, and generally it's the, you know, the higher frequency stuff doesn't bother us as much as the lower frequency stuff does. And so that's really kind of the difference between jitter and phase noise. Each measurement provides a look at kind of the same thing, but a look at it in a different way. Um, uh, uh, period jitter is the measure of noise at all frequency offsets um, and is done generally in the time domain and generally done with an oscilloscope. And you know, like I said, is a period and cycle type of measurement. Phase noise is a frequency domain measurement. It's generally looked at over a particular range of frequencies. It's generally done with a spectrum analyzer, but it allows us to see um, different types of deterministic jitter or random jitter more easily than we can see in the time domain. And so in that regard, it's a useful measurement for us. It more easily allows for measurement over different bands, frequency bands as well. So again, depending on the, the protocol that we're looking at, it would allow for us to do that. In theory, phase noise measured to an infinite degree would give us jitter but we only look at phase noise out to maybe one megahertz or, or 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz. So there is, you know, there could be a slight difference in value there. You know, when we look at a phase noise plot, um, 
or a, it could show up as a spectrum sweep off our network analyzer, which is what we see on the left-hand side. You know, we see our center frequency, which is the peak, and then we see all the noise that's really around that. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times in the phase noise plot, we don't necessarily look all the way into the center frequency. We start the phase noise plot maybe at one hertz or 10 hertz away from the center carrier. And so, you know, a lot of times that's why instead of seeing a sharp peak up here, we actually start the phase noise plot slightly lower. And that's because, again, we're not measuring all the way into the carrier. Um, the phase noise plot is basically the same as a spectrum sweep. Um, it's just we're only looking at half of it. Um, or a single sideband is what that's referred to, but we assume that there is another sideband on the other side. We assume that that sideband is the same as the single sideband that we're looking at, and we include that in our calculations. And so in, in, in that regard, we are actually, you know, doing a, taking a network sweep and calculating it. The other thing would be that uh, uh, they tend to use, we use a logarithmic scale in the phase noise plot. And that I think makes it easier for us to see a broader spectrum of frequencies. You know, it'd be hard to look at the detail in a 10 kilohertz to 20 megahertz, you know, plot if you didn't have a logarithmic scale, you'd have to have a pretty big sheet of paper in order to extend that out all the way. So, um, you know, uh, phase noise is used to calculate phase jitter. And that's what we'll look at now if we, you know, whenever we talk about phase jitter, again, rather than looking at the entire spectrum of noise that an oscillator may produce, we're looking at it over a fairly narrow bandwidth, 12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. And, and basically, we're looking at the area that's underneath the curve um, within those frequency bounds, and that's the phase jitter that we're talking about, uh, uh, the area underneath the curve between the frequencies of, of interest. And, and I have a slide later on that we could talk about uh, if we wanted to talk about, you know, further how we calculate phase noise or phase jitter from phase noise. So I can share that with you at the end of the presentation. You know, now we want to take a look at the performance of particular oscillator types. This would be some of our uh, jitter performance of our clocks. And again, we're looking at the phase noise plot for, for these clocks. Um, we have 156.25 megahertz, which is kind of an infiniband type of, of uh, a clock frequency. Um, and, and you can see that these are all relatively good performing clocks. Um, we have CMOS and LV Peckle, and both of them have about the same jitter performance. Um, the one thing that we do see, you know, see again is the jitter in the... Um, 12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz band, and that's where we have our stop and start frequencies on all these graphs, is about 130 to 120 femtoseconds. Um, typical clock performance is probably 30 uh, picoseconds peak to peak. It's probably three picoseconds RMS, depending on your conversion from peak to peak to RMS and what you use there. Um, and generally about one picosecond RMS in that 12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz bandwidth. One picosecond is kind of the standard. If it's above one picosecond, it might be a noisy clock. If it's under a picosecond in that band, then it's considered to be a relatively good clock. These, would, these particular clocks were designed for low jitter performance and we use a, a better IC inside in order to get that one, you know, 100 femto or 0.1 picosecond type of jitter accuracy. As I mentioned, the IC performance drives what we see from an output standpoint. And here would be an example of a, a fast delivery clock oscillator. In this particular oscillator, we use a PLL to change the frequency of the crystal. And we can change the M over N or the multiply and divide ratio of the PLL to generate almost any frequency we want. You know, that's kind of neat because it gives us fast delivery and enables us to give you clock oscillators in a matter of a day versus a matter of a few weeks, but it does create more jitter and more noise. And you can see that here in terms of the hump and the phase noise plot that we really weren't seeing on the first couple of plots. And that's because of the speed of the PLL that we use inside. Um, and that's what generates that hump for us. And we can see here, this is closer to what I was talking about as the typical clock type of performance 
for the jitter, it's about 885 femtoseconds or 0.9 picoseconds worth of RMS jitter over that 12 kilohertz to 20 megahertz bandwidth. TCXOs have very similar phase noise performance to um, clock oscillators. We do use, uh, and that's really because of the temperature compensation that we put into it. That uh, uh, tends to DQ the crystal and tends to drive a, a, a sensitivity to the, to the part and that actually degrades our jitter performance. In this case, we're looking at 40 megahertz clip sign versus 40 megahertz CMOS. And you can see that they both have similar sorts of phase noise characteristics about um, minus 150 dBC in terms of the noise floor and close in, they're both about 60 dB off, so very similar, but you'll see that the jitter of the clip sign is actually slightly lower, uh, about 120 femtoseconds um, and, uh, uh, versus 144, almost 150 femtoseconds of the CMOS, and that's because of the harmonics that are contained in the CMOS signal that aren't in the uh, the sine wave signal, the clip sign. So one of the ways you can get a lower jitter part is again, using a sine wave or using a clip sign. And, you know, we can show you how you can use sine waves to drive some of your logic circuits. So in that regard, uh, not necessarily a bad substitution to make. OCXOs is the final one we'll look at. In this case, this is one of our low phase noise uh, um, OCXOs. It's a hundred megahertz OCXO. Um, probably industry best in terms of phase noise, minus 180 dBC noise floor, the close in noise is um, at minus 60 at the one hertz offset, whereas the TCXOs was minus 60 at the 10 hertz offset. So you can see we've got a comparable difference and the phase jitter of this particular part is probably around 15 femtoseconds in that 12 kilohertz to, to 20 megahertz bandwidth. And so ultra low in terms of jitter performance. And we would all like to use OCXOs in our designs if we could, but OCXOs are the most expensive. They're also the, the biggest and they're also the most power hungry. And so that's why we have to make trade-offs and use the different oscillator types that we looked at because we may not have you know, the $50 to spend on an OCXO, we only have the 50 cents to spend on a clock oscillator and we only maybe have the, the dollar to spend on the TCXO. And so, you know, again, we kind of have to gauge the type of oscillator we use relative to the application, um, but we'd all ideally like to use OCXOs. And since we can't always use an OCXO, there are things that we can do in order to improve the jitter performance of our designs. And, you know, it's pretty basic stuff. Um, so, you know, this might be, uh, you know, uh, something that everybody is aware of, but the first thing I would do is check your clock, like I'd said earlier. Um, you know, and a lot of times we're not necessarily able to measure the jitter of the clock, we're really measuring the output of our system and whether it meets the system requirements. And if it meets the system requirements, then we assume everything inside is doing what it's supposed to. But if we don't meet our system requirements, then generally one of the first things I would look at would be the clock. And I would talk to your manufacturer. Maybe you're using a PLL clock um, that has a higher jitter performance and he's able to provide or they're able to provide a, a, what we call a direct output clock where the crystal is the same frequency as the output or we're not doing that type of multiplying and, and, and divide. Beyond that, you really want to employ, you know, best practices in all areas. Uh, your PCB layout, you want to do the proper layering in terms of ground planes between your signal planes and that sort of thing. You want to make sure that your traces are the right widths and, and you're not routing clock signals all around your board or the shortest possible type of thing. Um, and you're not routing them near noise sources like the clock or, or the TC or the or the power supply. You want to use proper loading. You want to make sure that you know you minimize any reflections and interferences that way. And you want to you know look at your positioning for oscillators. It's really location, location, location. You know you don't want to put an oscillator in the middle of your board where it could see a large uh, mechanical type of vibration. You don't want to put an oscillator near a fan where it's going to see thermal variation or again vibration as a function of the fan. 
we like oscillators to be kind of located out towards the edge of the board. That way they see minimal airflow. They have the best mechanical stability and the best thermal stability because that does impact oscillator performance. And here's where I'll kind of go against what I was saying earlier. You know, bigger is generally better for oscillators and crystals. Um, even though the industry trends are to go smaller in size um, because of cost and availability and those types of things, you know, bigger oscillators generally have better jitter performance because we get a better crystal in there. Um, higher supply voltages give us better performance, so we have better to signal to noise ratios and those types of things. And so, um, you know, in that regard, while, you know, we might be driven to use a battery if we're not, you know, and you have a choice between a, a 1.8 volt supply oscillator and a 3.3 or a 2.5 volt supply oscillator, choose the larger supply voltage because if you have that rail available, it will give you a better noise performance, a better jitter performance in the oscillator. The other thing you might want to look at is a different frequency. Um, you know, as frequency goes up, jitter tends to stay the same. So in that regard, you might be able to get a 100 megahertz clock to replace your 25 megahertz clock. And because you're now starting at a higher multiple in your design, you get a better end product that way. Um, you know, or again, just switching frequencies, you know, might change the design that the oscillator manufacturer is using again from maybe a PLL to more of a direct output type. You know, that's, you know, again, as you go up in frequency, that's where you got to start watching out for those PLL oscillators because that's an easy way for us to change the frequency. It's a low cost way. And, and we know when you come and talk to us, the first thing we want is, you know, size and cost, you know, type of thing. So we want to make sure that we're, uh, that we're meeting those. So, you know, in, in summary, uh, just to wrap it up and, you know, we're cooking along pretty good. Jitter falls into two primary categories, random and deterministic. Random jitter is difficult for us to control. We really kind of have to learn to live with that. Deterministic jitter though is the largest contributor. And so that's the good news. We have the chance to control that. The causes of deterministic jitter is, are usually identifiable. We can identify the power supply switching frequency in our output. We can identify the harmonics or we can identify the oscillator as a contributor to that. You know, different applications will require different measures of jitter. Cycle to cycle and period, period jitter are good for timing and sequencing applications. TIE jitter and, and or time interval error jitter and phase jitter are generally used for network timing and communication. And that's one of the reasons why, again, we see that measure that uh, one picosecond over that bandwidth, that 10 kilohertz or over 20 megahertz, we're actually starting to move that up as we get into faster and faster communication, uh, 40 gigabit, 400 gigabit, we're actually looking at higher speeds and that bandwidth is changing, You know, maybe 12 kilohertz to 50 megahertz now. Uh, depending on the speed of your system. So, um, and jitter may be measured in the time domain or frequency domain. And, and again, how it's measured is dependent on the type that's particular to your particular application. Time domain measurements are best for period and cycle to cycle jitter. And so in that regard, timing and sequencing again, frequency domain measurements are more suitable for phase jitter. But however you do it, Different levels of performance are available for different levels of oscillators. They will vary, jitter will vary by frequency, oscillator type, stability package, voltage. All those things kind of go into it. And so, you know, the bottom line recommendation is talk to your supplier. If you've got a jitter problem, there's more than one way for us to skin that cat. And so if you've got a jitter problem, we can probably bring about a different oscillator or another solution that will help you without having to redesign your entire system, you know, to get rid of that jitter problem. So there you go. Um, in 30 minutes or less or pretty close to that, you've got, you know, a top level look at jitter. You got a top level look at jitter measurements. And uh, now if there's any questions, we can we can probably get to those. But, you know, thanks for coming. So far, I have no questions here. Any questions from the audience? So I'll just throw another graph up there. Just this is a look at phase noise. Um, and I don't, unfortunately, I do have, have jitter there, but this is, 
um, uh, 156.153.6 uh, and a 622 megahertz oscillator. And you can see the yellow, the 622 is actually uh, uses a multiplier, but ends up with 43 picoseconds worth of jitter relative to the 153.6, which is about four times that or 187 picoseconds. So jitter will change based on the frequency that you start with. And that's an option for you to look at. The other thing I had mentioned well, I don't, uh, is calculating phase jitter. And this gives you a look at how we might calculate uh, uh, phase jitter in terms of using the areas under the plot and then plugging them into the log calculations that we have there. And, and so this would be a quick and dirty way to make, you know, to calculate phase jitter from phase noise. So, you know, with that, then I'm definitely done. So I appreciate your time and attention. Yes, sir. Thank you. Corey, you mentioned this package also the fact that how significant is the voltage versus the other factors? Um, I, it's one of the more significant factors. Yeah. So, okay. The, so the, the question was, um, how significant is supply voltage differences to jitter performance relative to the other differences like size or temperature or that type of thing? Um, so, you know, temperature, you know, generally we don't like to replace a clock with a TCXO, right? Um, and so if you're really looking at clock to clock, um, and just looking at swapping a clock, swapping the rail is the best way to reduce the jitter, um, you know, in basically the same size clock. TCXO, you know, temperature is an issue. TCXOs generally have better jitter performance than clocks do. OCXOs have better jitter performance than, um, than you know, TCXOs do, but that's a cost change. Um, you know, when you swap a rail, it's basically the same price, okay? When you go from 2.5 to 3.3, you know, you, there's really no difference in the cost of the oscillator, but if you go from a clock to a TCXO, there you're gonna bump the price a little bit. So, you know, I would, you know, if you wanna stay within plane, so to speak, you want, you know, that supply voltage is a big difference. Any other questions? Okay, no. thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone who joined online. Um, this, as a reminder, was recorded. It'll be posted to right. its YouTube channel and then shared on the Meetup group where you found it. We'll also include Corey's contact information. So thanks for joining us virtually and thanks to everyone here in person. <laughs>